Well, you've sort of brought us to where we want to go in the next segment, which is really talking about maintenance and consolidation approaches. Um, there are six of us on the panel, so there are probably eight different ways we do this uh, collectively as a group. So let's just talk about general principles about maintenance therapy. Continuous, short-term, endpoint-driven, risk-driven. How, how do you do it? Let's, let's start with Nuber. So uh, for me, I'm using continuous based on the CLGB data. I certainly will put most of my patients on lenalidomide maintenance. The way those trials were done, the way CLGB trial was done was continue until progression. I think it would be very useful for us at this point in time to figure out, you know, who are the ones who need that continuous. And because of the fact that we don't know that just as yet, I'm actually continuing on everybody, but those studies are warranted. In certain high-risk patients, Sagar, this is based on data from your mm -hmm. group, actually, which has looked at deletion 17 uh, patients where you've used a doublet, you've used bortezomib as well as lenalidomide. I would tend to do that in that patient population. So patients five years out, standard risk, ongoing CR, continue? If they're tolerating it, if I'm having trouble yeah, yeah. with counts, or I I don't tolerate toxicity in the okay. maintenance setting, and if they have toxicity, we stop. Uh, there's a level of comfort with a patient as well. When a patient has been on a drug for as long as that, they are very hesitant to stop it, mm -hmm. and that's why they continue. Eight years. I'm going to push it to eight. Still yeah. go. I do too. I, I'm just I have a few who <laughs> yeah, are yeah. on treatment yeah. that long and for. All yeah. right. Heather, agree? Disagree? I agree. Actually, the the only survival data we have is from the CALGB study, and those patients are still on therapy, and they're they're over five years out now. Okay. Uh, I've, I've accrued a, a lot of patients on that study, and mm -hmm. we're still treating patients on that study. The one thing I'm always sobered by is that I still have patients who were on the placebo arm, mm -hmm. and those patients some of those patients were offered to when the progression-free survival data mm -hmm. um, was revealed and they were offered uh, to switch, to put be put on lenalidomide maintenance, right. they, uh, they didn't. And some of those patients are still in a complete mm -hmm. remission. So I'm always sobered by seeing them. I, but it, I would say still in general. I'm putting. I'm. I'm using lenalidomide continuously. And Maury's probably got more of those untreated, maintained patients. I have a than lot, the rest but, of us. but but <laughs> uh, quite honestly, what are the thought leaders in the United States doing? And the, and the easiest way is to look at the current CTN trial. You've got three arms: uh, single transplant, single transplant consolidation, double transplant. But what are they doing about maintenance? Well, all three arms had maintenance as a given. And it started at 36 months maintenance, and they've revised the trial to make it continuous maintenance. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't prove it. But these are thought leaders in the field who feel that this is the best way to optimize the care of these patients. Okay. Raphael, one size fits all, or do you? No, no, no. Medicine is very nuanced. So I agree with everything <laughs> that uh, Nupur was saying. You know, I, I, I certainly for my high-risk patients, I use a doublet combination of a protosome inhibitor, and, and that's based on data from, from your group, data from the... Europeans as well too from the CAVA study, the Neven study, there's there's really good data to suggest that that the high risk patients can be helped with this. For the low risk patients, I don't know, I scratch my head every time so much more thinking about what the options are for patients. I, I have to admit I don't put all my patients in maintenance right now. I have a long discussion with them. For me it's easier to discuss transplant and explain transplant <laughs> than to discuss maintenance. That, that appointment is longer because I think it's more nuanced. And now when you throw in a variable such as the availability of elotuzumab, I was trying to think, you know, do I want to keep my powder dry for that rep with elotuzumab as opposed to do it with maintenance? And I have patients who are doing great who are without maintenance, and then I have patients who are being greater than eight years uh, who have enjoyed a very good period of d disease control with a continuous administration of lenalidomide. Okay. So transplant dead or not dead? We've, we've skipped on both sides of it. We talked about induction. We talked about maintenance. We haven't really talked about the role of transplant. Jayton, do you want to... Tell us where it fits in your mind, and we'll see how the group views that, whether you're right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have to be very careful, because I think that um, what we've seen is that transplant has led to improvements in overall survival, um, clearly. Right? And, so, and, now is, and that's with our older therapies. And now we have new therapies. And so the question is becoming, in the area of new therapies, do we need a transplant? 
But you have to be very careful. Just because you can ask that question doesn't mean you know the answer, mm -hmm. despite being thought leaders or having experience or without any data. So unless you have data saying that transplant is no longer necessary, because clearly you have 20 years of experience in multiple randomized clinical trials showing that transplant improves overall survival. So just because we can ask that question, right. we should not make that leap and assume we know that answer when you're talking about overall survival. And I'll modify that just a little bit and to say that while I think the current ongoing CTN trial is an important one, asking that question about early versus delayed, the net result of that trial, if it goes the way the experimental arm would look at it, says that they're equivalent. Well, that's not really a step forward, right? I mean, I think what we want is steps forward, and my sense of at least the IFM pilot data says that RVD induction, single transplant, maintenance therapy has a really long progression-free survival, especially for the MRD negative. So, you know, my, my thinking on this has switched as well. Maury, you were going to make a comment? Transplant is alive and well, uh, pending the results of the two trials that Nupar referred to for the European myeloma network. Mm -hmm. But Palumbo published tandem MEL100 versus no transplant. It was clearly better with the tandem transplant. A subset analysis of the Hovon, single versus tandem, showed that there was a survival benefit in multivariable analysis for tandem. All trials show deepening of response after the transplant. Uh, I was very excited by an MMRC uh, trial that looked at carfilzomib len dex induction followed by transplant, and after induction, the greater than or equal to NCR was 24%, post-transplant was 69%, and then by time the end of consolidation, it was 84%. MRD negative. So for right now, I think too, you have to prove transplant is not valuable and the default is not to make things up and say we've got novel agents, so therefore I don't need a transplant. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I would totally agree with all of that. I would just, you know, the trials we are doing, I do think the transplant is probably going to deepen remission. I think if we can identify the subset of patients, which may be a small subset, who will not benefit from a transplant, that's going to be very useful information as well so that we do not put them through the toxicity of going through the transplant and kind of come up with something novel for that patient population. Okay, so we, you know, melphalan has been around since before I was. Um, there are new formulations of melphalan that are in development. Does anybody have experience with these Captasol melphalan approaches or anything along those lines? I don't have any experience to date, but I, I think that um, it's an interesting compound. Mm -hmm. It likely has more benefits for our pharmacists and nurses right. at the moment. Right. Um, this is a captasol enabled product. It it extends the half-life half -life yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. for for some of us doctors, I don't think we really understand the time, what it takes to mix the drug, uh, regular mm -hmm. off-the-shelf melphalan, and get it into the patient within 60 minutes um, is, yeah. is what is what happens behind the scenes. We just write the orders, yeah. and we and the transplant happens, but we don't we don't really realize that uh, what goes on in the pharmacy and the nur and the nursing staff to get this melphalan and and the degree of disintegration. Mm -hmm. um, that occurs with with regular melphalan. We don't know. You, we never even measure right. uh, what dose patients get. Right, right. You know, and with busulfan, we do PK directed mm -hmm. therapy. With melphalan, we don't do PK directed therapy. So I think it's it's interesting because perhaps we'll actually hit our target dose uh, right. more frequently with the captasol enabled product. Um, there's some uh, interest in, in perhaps it'll have less toxicity. I don't mm -hmm. think we can say that unless there's a randomized study. Right. Um, I think that it may lead us to be able to push the dose and that may deepen the response. We may be able to have PK-directed therapy with this product. Okay. No, I think that's a great point and even old drugs can be made better. So, all right. Well, this has been a great discussion. Um,